Good morning and good evening. Now, we, this afternoon, we will have a lecture on generation for reactor design concepts that will be delivered by, by Mr. Chirayo Bartra. You know him already, and please listen carefully and ask him questions either in chat or then online here. So, Chirayo, Shri Batra, please go ahead with your lecture. Thank you, Vladimir. I think you have to stop sharing before yeah, I can. I do. Okay, great. <clears throat> cool. So, I think you already know me, and I hope I will not bore you with the lecture. I hope you are enjoying it so far. But let's go ahead. So, <clears throat> I'll be delivering the lecture on uh, Generation 4 Reactor Designs. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes I get uh, really excited about my lectures because I'm too invested in them. And this is one of those lectures where I'm, I'm really invested and in. you will see why I'm invested in this as well. So <clears throat> before I start, brief acknowledgement for Professor Mikityuk. Uh, this lecture is based on the presentation that he gave in 2018. So there's a powerful storytelling which is involved in this lecture. And with the permission of Professor Mikityuk, I have taken this story and I've prepared this lecture with some minor modifications. So if you want to see the original lecture, uh, the recordings are also available on YouTube for the 2018 lecture. <clears throat> so this is the brief outline of my presentation. I'll talk about mainly the Generation 4 International Forum Reactor Design Concepts. Uh, I'll give a broad introduction to what GIF is, what are the GIF goals, and uh, what kind of technology selection they have done, uh, I'll also briefly tell how they have done it because they have a very strong criteria on how this selection is done. Uh, I'm not giving this lecture on behalf of GIF, uh, so I have no relation with Generation for International Forum, so I can also give uh, some of my independent uh, opinion or independent uh, review of what I feel about it. So take this lecture also in that way. And as I said, that uh, this is more of a storytelling, so you can just relax, sit back, and, and, and enjoy the lecture. So I hope... Uh, uh, you'll be enjoying it as much as I enjoyed when I first heard this lecture, so will be good. What, what I feel before I go, go ahead with this, uh, with the explanation of these technologies is that GIF has put forth a very strict criteria. So most of the designs that you see currently in the market, they might or might not be qualifying all of those criteria. So GIF has like four criteria, eight goals, and then several other parameters to qualify whether the, the, the reactor design is actually a generation four design or not. I mean, and in most of the technology industries, that's how it, it happens. I mean, you qualify the technologies from one generation to another to see how they improve. So the intent is correct to see that how moving from one generation to another, we can lead to a better product. But in this journey, whether these requirements became too stringent or not, this is something I leave uh, for you to decide. But in my personal opinion that these requirements could be very strict and not all of the designs which are currently in the market might qualify for all of them. However, they will still claim as generation four design. So uh, you have to be a bit aware. You have to be a bit observant uh, when you look at these generation four designs and understand whether they actually are generation four designs or near to them. So this I will leave for you to have your own expert judgment on that. So I will talk about the general features of these different designs. Then I will also go into the specific design concept. So we'll pick up one concept, give the design description for that one, uh, and then specific features of the selected design. So once we select a design out of this six, and then I'll go into the specific features for that. And then some broad concluding statements will also be given at the end. Uh, this is how the reactors actually evolved. So we have been talking about generation four, but I think it's also important to understand that what were the previous generations. So the first generation of reactors were like from 1950s to 60s, which now probably are still a couple of them functioning in UK, but most of them have already retired. And this, I also say this was previous to the era of regulation, as I like to call them, because if I take about the big regulators like US and RC, they were mainly established in 70s where they started regulating more. And that's where this requirements for safety and then things like that came into being. Before that, they were more like demonstration projects becoming commercial. But then in the generation two, where there was this stringent requirements already coming into place, 
Uh, these were also designed for longer lifetime. They had a particular design configurations and things like that. So from 1970s to most of them will be retiring in, in 2040. So I can we can say that majority of our fleet is currently generation two. So and the new ones that are currently under development or deployment are actually generation three or three plus with almost none of generation four designs actually coming into life uh, as a commercial project so far. We can, again, as I said, the definition of generation four could be challenging. Uh, we might claim some of the sodium cooled fast reactors like BN series could be generation four reactor, but whether it qualifies all the criteria and goal, we'll see through the story whether that happens or not. So most of the designs currently are generation three plus, and I've also written the IEA definitions of evolutionary and innovative, which I also explained in my first lecture. But the goal of this generation three or three plus designs as they are deployed now was to have some simpler designs some reduced cost maybe more efficient in terms of uh, usage of the fuel or even in the terms of efficiency of the final power of, of the power plant in general uh, a high emphasis was also on the safety uh, the availability should be more higher so that means the longer operating life as well as higher capacity factor there should be reduced core damage frequencies the aim to have higher burn up because we want to extract as much energy as we want as we can from the fuel uh, better load following capabilities this is also becoming more and more important when we are talking about the mix of the renewables that is coming into the market and then there was some brief let's say attempt to also make modular design through ap600 which was uh, certified for design but never licensed to build and the bigger version AP1000 was actually licensed to build later. So we, we are seeing some AP1000 coming into uh, connect, getting connected to the grid recently. <clears throat> then moving ahead in this generation, the generation four designs uh, were then targeted to be safe, secure, sustainable, competitive, and versatile in application. We also have to understand that we need both technical as well as uh, an institutional innovation if you want to reach these uh, goals of, of, of generation four. So. No. So, the, so the technical solution itself is not an enough condition. It might be a necessary condition, but it's not an enough condition. We need some kind of institutional innovation and the institutional innovation could be in the form of legal frameworks or regulatory framework or deployment strategies, whatever you call them. We need something beyond just moving to the technology for this generation for reactor designs to come into life. <clears throat> this is just a summary of uh, my previous slide that uh, Within this evolution, some examples are, are given for early prototypes, which were classified as generation one. And then they were usually of, of smaller scale than this gigawatt scale that, that started now. I, I wanted to put a graph which shows that how now the number of reactors is very much equal to the number of gigawatts that are being installed, that, that, that are being installed or put into the grid. But this was not the case before. There were like large number of reactors coming online but they were always usually smaller. And I gave part of the reason in my first lecture as well. So here you can see some examples that the early prototypes were almost of all type. They were like gas cooled reactor, heavy water reactor, sodium cooled fast reactor, high temperature gas cooled reactor and pressurized water reactor. And then once we moved to this generation two where we wanted to deploy large reactors massively at a speed, you can see here that all of these reactor technologies became like water cooled reactor design. So where most of the world started following the light water reactor path. Some countries also took the path of heavy water reactor like Canada or India. So then this became major technology. And that's what we have to understand that part of the reasons for this was that the industry moved towards this design, which was commercialized first. And then probably through the learning process, the learning curve made it such that it was much faster to deploy this technology. And uh, I always say that the customer as well as the cost that will always drive the, the, the technology further. So here, this was this technology was demonstrated. It was safer, and then everybody started following the following the same technology in different countries, and that's where the mass deployment of generation two happened. Then there was a hope to make them better. That's where the generation three or three plus started, and we are seeing several of the design, and all of them are also again water cooled reactor design. But then, I think. Uh, <clears throat> The, the the whole human race is, is developing based on the innovations that we are doing in different fields. So the nuclear should not be left behind that. And that's where I feel that the innovative designs uh, 
become really important which was actually similar to what happened in the generation 1 but the goals might be different in this one the generation 1 was more focused on like how to get them done but now generation 4 is like now we know the technology for most of them let's see how we can build them at 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 a, at a scale that we want to build for meeting the energy demands of the world so this is what we'll see happening i mean the prediction for mass deployment uh, has always been from 2030 onwards so this uh, this decade i still call as the decade of technology demonstration and strategy build up and then hopefully if we are doing things correctly in this decade we'll see mass deployment of generation for reactor technologies happening from the next decade onwards now briefly on what gif is so it was established in 2001 so it's almost a two decade old organization uh, it was a cooperative international endeavor which was seeking to develop the research which is necessary to test the feasibility and performance of the fourth generation of nuclear systems uh, and then the idea from the very beginning was to make them deployed by 2030 so i think they are they were probably predicting quite early that this is going to take time it's not going to be an, an easy uh, going process so gif has almost 13 countries and european union uh, <clears throat> but eurotom has 27 countries so it, it's it's a large uh, membership gif has a large membership which is then coordinating the research and development on, on these systems and there are several european projects also which are always floated to uh, to fund these kind of projects so gif then identified through their stringent criteria as i said they have criteria goals and different parameters uh, i think there was a big exercise to evaluate all of the designs possible designs and then finally they came up uh, to the conclusion of this six major designs which i have listed here the sodium cooled fast reactor the lead cooled fast reactor the gas cooled fast reactor the very high temperature reactor super critical water cooled reactor and the molten salt reactor and you can see here that out of uh, <clears throat> all of the six technology five are fast reactors and there is a reason for that and and we'll we'll talk about that in the coming lectures what i also want to give you an idea is that what is the i mean some typical characteristics of this gif technology as as one slide and then of course we'll go into detail into each of this so here also you can see the neutron spectrum is basically fast for all of them except uh, the uh, high temperature gas cooled reactor which can only operate in thermal the coolants are varied from gas to to liquid metal to even water so the super critical water reactor still uses water and we'll look into more properties later then these are the operating temperature some of them are operating at very high temperature and most of them are actually operating at high temperature and this is what also makes them uh you bit different is that now it opens the gates gate for different applications which have been always been emphasizing that uh for the for nuclear to play a bigger role in the energy scenario it has to go beyond uh, the electricity production because the main output that comes from the nuclear reactors is actually heat and we should be more open to using the heat uh, uh, for for different application then fuel cycle is is open or closed depending upon also the configuration that you want to use uh <clears throat> we can debate on which cycles can be closed and what are the processes required for that but i think you have a different lecture on fuel cycle and i think you will get more insights or, or, or through that lecture as well um these are the typical sizes so they can range from micro reactors to large reactors so in this uh, when the when gif was formulated i think uh, the smrs were were not so fancy at that point of time as they have become now so they were not uh, very much keen into talking uh, about smrs but i have seen the shift as well that gif also has now special task force working on smr so because most of these i mean as i said in my previous lecture it, it does not it doesn't make us i mean i'm not proposing smr or large reactor i propose like nuclear is a solution and depending upon where you want to put and what kind of output you want to if you have a massive demand for energy use large reactors i mean it does not make sense to have smrs when your electricity demand is huge but there might be some niche application or if the cost is effective then why not so there should be more broader consideration than only talking about smrs these are some example developers which i have taken from wikipedia or some other sources that uh, these are the current uh, techno vendors which are developing these technologies and this can be taken also for reference <clears throat> we also have to understand that whether these gif technologies have been already deployed or what is the status of their de uh, development as well as deployment and you can see that out of the six four of them have already been built in one form or the another 
either as a demonstration project or even experimental or even commercial projects. Two of them are, are still in operation, the sodium cool fast reactor in Russia and high temperature gas cool reactor in, in China, the HTRPM. But the good thing to note here is that all of them have an existing project in pipeline. So sooner or later, we will hopefully see some of the projects coming online. <clears throat> this is just to show that these six designs, the red box shows that it's fast spectrum design. The blue box shows that it's thermal spectrum design. Whereas this in supercritical water reactor, you can see that there is a dashed line for red, which means that it is primarily thermal, but with a design configuration, it can also be operated in a, in a fast spectrum. Whereas for molten salt cooled reactor, it is also primarily fast, but it can also be operated as a thermal spectrum based upon again on the design configuration. And all of them can have these applications, which I will not repeat. These are the currently operating fast reactor. Why I have put this here is because I said five out of six, six technologies are fast reactors. And this is just to show that at least uh, for fast reactor technology, there is good understanding of sodium cooled fast reactor, but that does not eliminate the need or the experience or expertise that we are gaining in other fast reactor technologies as well. These are the designs and the development. I have crossed one, which I also want to highlight is the Astrid project in France. This also happened because of the national policy to shift it uh, to a later part of the century for the development and focus more on the current fleet uh, for their needs. And then, as I say, uh, again, it depends upon the country's policies, the economic requirements, and what they foresee as the future. I mean, if a company or a country does not see Generation 4 reactor technologies coming into picture soon, and if it does not make a commercial sense, it's not going to happen. So. It's very important that they make commercial sense uh, rather other than also being technically competent. So these are uh, sev several designs which are under development and you will see these are also fast reactors and most of them are sodium and some of them are lead or even lead bismuth reactors. I always try to separate SMRs because that's what uh, my job is also. So these are just fast SMRs under development, which probably you briefly also saw in Vladimir's presentation. And these are also at uh, different stages of development. Uh, some of the, let's say, <clears throat> status is given in the last column, which is like prediction from these countries that uh, when they can expect these reactors to come, come online. <clears throat> so the idea for the Generation 4 reactors is to actually make nuclear sustainable. And then most of the goals like safety, economic competitiveness, or the proliferation resistance, waste management, efficiency of resource usage, which is like high burn up, recycling, efficiency, uh, of, of the plant in general, or again, the important point here is the flexibility of application. They all come into picture if you want to make nuclear sustainable. And looking into at such different characteristics, GIF decided to figure out four goals or criteria as they call them. In this presentation, I'll call them goals, but I think on the website, they call them criteria and then they have eight goals uh, corresponding to each of these criteria. So the first goal is sustainability. By sustainability, what GIF defines is that there should be a possibility for long-term fuel supply. Now, this could also be questionable that do we have enough uranium for the current fleet that can uh, just keep it running for hundreds or thousands of years? Yes or no. But this will, again, be a question on demand and supply. Sometimes we feel that if there is a demand, there will be an exploration process and we'll have enough uranium. So for now, we feel there is enough uranium, but that might not be the case. And that's why we have to make sure that how we can close the cycle or use some other concepts which can actually breed uh, more fuel and use uh, some other cycle other than the uranium cycle, maybe plutonium or thorium cycle. The goal is also to minimize the waste and long-term burden of, of this waste. I mean, we cannot deny that there is certain form of radiotoxicity that is left behind after the reactor operation. What I can say with confidence is that we know how to manage it. It's a manageable process, but if there is a possibility to minimize it, we could also do that through other uh, fuel cycle options, and that's what they mean by sustainability. Then safety and reliability is that there should be very low likelihood and degree of core damage. The current fleet is already very safe. So uh, this does not mean that the current fleet is not safe. It's just a, a hope that the when we move from one generation to another, uh, the core damage frequency should uh, be reduced further. And the other important thing that I feel is the eliminate the need for offsite emergency response, because if we are able to reach this goal, then it just makes nuclear more flexible in terms of site independence so that 
the site can be located wherever we want. Uh, in terms of economics, this is probably one of the most important goal is that the life cycle cost advantage should be there in comparison to the other energy sources. So we always have to consider not only the existing fleet, but the other energy sources which are coming into market now. If nuclear has to compete, the life cycle cost has to go down. Uh, the financial risk, because sometimes nuclear projects are, are really long projects and uh, I don't want to emphasize which ones, but if the project takes too long, there's a big financial risk that's involved in that. If that risk stays, we will never find more investors coming into that. So we have to find that how the commercial risks become acceptable. And that's also one of the goals for this. So this is uh, something which I, which I really uh, like and emphasize uh, usually. Then the goal four is to have proliferation resistance and physical protection, which is always the goal for any of the reactor that we're making. So this is now my template for how the story will go. I'll talk about the general concept, the image and the main features. I'll give some fact sheet. I'll give some specific examples. And then we'll see the problems from the viewpoint of Generation 4 International Forum. So for this story, our reference design is the pressurized water reactor, which you all know. The specific design that I have taken here is the EPR reactor. The thermal power is 4,300 megawatt. The electrical power will be 1,650 megawatt electrical. The efficiency is more or less 35%. The primary coolant that is used is water. The pressure, primary pressure is 60 megapascal. The inlet and outlet temperature are, is a temperature difference of around 30 degrees Celsius. The coolant and the moderator is same, is, is, is water. The spectrum is thermal. And in terms of uh, generation four goals, that's what we have to look into this throughout this presentation, is how sustainable they are, how safe and reliable they are, and what is the status of the economics for these reactors. So in terms of sustainability, it has been marked as poor because we have to take into consideration sustainability from the fact that how is the fuel being used in the reactor. And we'll see that there are better options for improving the sustainability of the reactor. So the fuel used in the PWR fuel rod is the enriched uranium dioxide fuel. We already we all know that there are control rods inserted into every fuel assembly. Here you can see a schematic of the uh, one of the assemblies of a pressurized water reactor. It's usually a square lattice uh, assembly with usually 17 by 17 pins in one assembly and around uh, 200 assemblies in one reactor for a gigawatt scale plant. The cladding used is, is zircaloy. Uh, it's an open assembly, so you can see some cross flows happening between the assemblies. Uh, this also helps in uh, doing a better heat transfer across the core. The fuel rod is made up of very small pellets, which are one centimeter in diameter. That's what you can see here. Uh, on the left side of the screen. And for the better management of the, uh, let's say, the shutdown capability of the reactor, the control rods are actually inserted in each of the fuel assembly, as I mentioned before. Now, what are the advantages of pressurized water reactor? Uh, it has got an operational experience and it's an established technology. So we very well know how this operates. So in terms of operation, there are very less unknowns. And we always li like to reduce the number of unknowns that we have uh, for any of the technology we want to work with. Uh, light water is used as a coolant, which is abundantly available. It is transparent, it's easy to handle as well. Uh, and it also allows for the boron control done through the uh, coolant or the moderator itself. So there is an added mechanism for the reactivity control, which can be done with the help of uh, light water, which is uh, flowing through the reactor. So the challenges are it has got a high coolant pressure, which somehow none of the engineer likes to work in high pressure environment. Uh, this is the point about sustainability that uh, we cannot achieve enough breeding to make sure that we have enough supply of the fuel. Uh, the designs and the development are several. I've listed a few of them like EPR, AP1000 or APR 1400. Uh, there are almost 300 reactors under operation, which are light water, it could be uh, it, it could be heavy water or light water. They are water cooled reactor designs with an operation cap capacity of around 290 gigawatt electrical. Uh, so, from generation three to generation four. Now, when we want to move from this concept that we heard now, if we want to increase the efficiency, so right now we see the efficiency is 37%. Can anybody guess? And you can just maybe switch on your mic or just shout it from the, from the class as you like. How can you increase the efficiency? Any quick answer on that? I'll just take 15, 10 seconds break. If not, then I'll just go ahead. Okay, no one, I think. 
I hope you are awake. You're not sleeping. Huh? Okay, let's go. So the way to improve the efficiency is usually to increase the water pressure and temperature. So that's what we'll try to see how we can do that for the secondary side in case we want to improve the efficiency. So in order to reach this goal, the first concept that I'm going to discuss is the supercritical water reactor cool concept. So it operates at a very high pressure, which is uh, the thermal. Hello. Did I drop off or the meeting was? The meeting seems to have ended abruptly. Okay, okay. I thought like I dropped off or something. We had a technical problem here. Now restarting, restarting the meeting, and Chirai will continue. Wait a minute on this. Let's see his the supercritical water cool reactor concept, where we're going to operate at above thermodynamic critical point of the water, which is around 22 megapascal or 374 degrees Celsius. We want to combine the technology which is known in the coal plants, which is a supercritical water reactor technology. It will be a direct one through steam cycle. So that means there will be no steam generator or steam separators and dryers, as possibly is also the case in, 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 the, in the boiling water reactor. And here you can see two schematics that, what do I mean by the critical point? So this will be the supercritical fluid. This will be the operating temperature and pressure for this reactor in order to improve the efficiency of, of, the, of the cycle. Now, what are the advantages for this is that it's based on the generation three plus technology. So we already know this technology very well. We have uh, plenty of, let's say, operational experience with, with the kind of fluid we are dealing with. It also merges with the advanced supercritical water reactor technology that is currently being used in coal plants. So there is a lot of operational experience in the coal plants already for that. So this is just a merger of these two. And the higher steam enthalpy uh, will also allow the reduction in the size of the turbine system. So if that happens, then it will also lead to the lower capital cost uh, on, on the conventional island as well. It has got a higher efficiency uh, than the Generation 3 Plus reactor, and that was the goal we were targeting through this, uh, uh, through this story. And then it can work on both thermal and, and fast spectrum, and this will depend upon the reactor core design that we take into picture. Uh, there are certain challenges, which is because we are operating at high pressure and temperature, the material challenge will always come, and that will come probably in most of the designs. Uh, what I also want to tell is that challenges does not mean that we cannot do it. It's just that we need certain kind of an engineering solution to do it. And probably some engineering solutions are already available, but the others might need to be, to be developed as well. Uh, there is uh, some gaps in the thermal hydraulics that, that needs to be filled uh, to understand properly the supercritical water heat transfer and the critical flow databases. Uh, the safety demonstration probably would be needed, and that will be the case for, for most of the, uh, the reactors, which are trying to employ uh, a different concept in case there are no uh, experimental data available. So uh, if we are using fast spectrum, and I think this might have been touched in other lectures as well, that there's a chance to have a positive wide effect. So in case supercritical water reactor are also operated at, in a fast spectrum, then we need to see that. Then, of course, the challenges of fuel qualification, because if you're operating at high temperature, uh, then the fuel temperature might also reach to a, to a higher temperature. And we'll see that in the next slide, how that is also dealt with. Uh, the designs and the development of this uh, high-performance light water reactor in the European Union. 
and there are none under operation. So then I'll take the example of the high performance light water reactor. What you see here is that the Delta T, which was in the light water, in the pressurized water reactor around 30 degrees has now reached around 200 degrees. So this is a big issue for the peak cladding temperature, which is usually targeted for less than 700 degrees Celsius or around 630 degrees Celsius. As I said, every challenge probably has some solution, whether that's applicable or not. But in this case, the possible solution is heating in three steps. And this is very interesting. And this is something I also got to learn while preparing for this lecture. So what happens in a supercritical water reactor is that there is water ingress through the vessel inlet and it's divided into two parts, half-half uh, briefly, or let's say approximately. The blue means, let's say it is relatively cold and red means it's hot. So what happens is that the water goes into the downcomer region, and I will show that in the next slide where it is. Then it goes into the lower plenum, goes into the core inlet chamber, and then follow the black line here with me that it goes into first into the evaporator, goes into a permixing cham chamber, and all of these are done in order to reduce the power at each step. And so also to reduce the temperature of the coolant that uh, reduce the temperature of the peak cladding that has to be avoided. Then it goes into the superheater one, then goes again into the lower mixing chamber to get some homogeneity, then goes back into the superheater two, goes into the core outlet temperature, and then goes outside. Then the other half, it goes into the upper plenum, and then it goes into the water boxes. As you can see in the center of this assembly, there are certain water boxes. So this also helps uh, in, in moderating the, 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 uh, the spectrum. So this will also uh, keep the spectrum soft. And that's why the water, the cold, relatively cold water flows into these boxes and then goes back into the lower mixing chamber to also have uniform mixture of the, of the temperature. So this water boxes with separate circulation circuit is, uh, is to improve the moderation as I has already explained. And you can also see that the assemblies have a, a wire wrapper as it's the case for the uh, sodium cooled fast actor or fast actor. So there is no grid plate, but these are grid spacers, but these are the wire wrappers around the assemblies to keep the core compact. This is how you see, this was the block diagram, but this is how you will actually see in the reactor itself. So there is a feed water inlet, water will come inside, get divided into two parts. One goes up, one goes down to the downcomer. Then from the downcomer in, in, in the lower plenum, it goes into the evaporator, goes here, comes back into the superheater, goes here, goes back into the superheater two, and then comes out. What it does is that it also allows the vessel to be isolated from the high temperature. So the only high temperature that you will see is actually in the outlet flange. And most of the reactor will be not seeing such high, such high temperatures uh, as the other part of the evaporator and superheater will be seeing. This is how the core will look like. And this is also just to give you again that how the flow will happen. As you said, it will go from the downcomer to the evaporator. So this blue are evaporator. And then from there, it goes to the superheater one, and then it goes to the superheater two zone, and then it comes out of the reactor. Uh, there are several alloys. These are candidate alloys for, uh, for, the, uh, for, the, for the cladding, like ferritic martensic steel, stainless steel, nickel-based alloys, or the, or the oxide dispersed steel alloys, because we are reaching quite high temperature in this. So that's why we have to think of uh, certain other materials. So the balance of plant is will not be much different uh, from from the other power systems as we will see uh, as we can see from this from this slide that we reach high temperature and and pressure in the primary side which then allows us to extract more heat and then which also allows us to have better efficiency like around 44% in this case and then the rest of the balance plant like uh, high pressure turbine low pressure turbine intermediate pressure turbine uh, then the preheaters, etc., cetera, are, are very common in, in, in the other balance of plants as well. Now, moving from here, uh, continuing the story, let's see that we want to keep the high efficiency. So we, want, we, we don't want to go back to lower efficiency plant. But at the same time, we want to avoid parameters which are related to the high pressure and temperature. So what can we do in this scenario to improve or go from this design to another design? Any guess? Five seconds. So unmute and shout or shout in the class. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, none. Okay. So the idea is that Sorry. we can use inert gas instead of, of water. So that's what uh, we can try to do. And that's where the concept of uh, 
a high temperature or very high temperature or high temperature gas cooled reactor comes into place. Uh, this can be in two configurations, as I briefly explained in my first lecture, that it could be both graphite prismatic uh, or again graphite based pebble bed reactor, which are considered as the reference configurations in the GIF and which are also currently under development. Both of the designs are under development. Uh, it comes with a very low power density, which is an advantage and disadvantage at the both the side. At, 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 at the same time, we also heard some discussion during the first day that how the sodium pool fast reactor in, in the BN chain in, in Russia from BN 600 to 1200 is also going for lower power density. So this is something that uh, has been considered that uh, if we can operate at low power density and still reach higher efficiency and better fuel utilization, then why not do it? Why? So, I see at least some people are interested and they are willing to contribute. Yeah. Please mute your microphones. <laughs> so, following the same procedure as the other reactors, the some of the advantages for the high high temperature gas react, gas cool reactors are they have uh, as they as they can reach high temperature, there is a possibility for more non electrical applications. They are considered as walk away safe because the configuration of the trisofuel particle is such that it can withstand very high temperature without any fuel damage. Uh, the gas coolant is inert, so we are not dealing with, let's say, a very corrosive or toxic environment. And it has also got a, a very high uh, efficiency because of, again, the reasons that we have been following through. So the high temperature, which enables uh, a lot of application, also comes with its challenges that uh, uh, we can reach really high temperature, that means we also have to have materials which can withstand that temperature, but this can also be then used for hydrogen production. Uh, the coupling with the process heat application might require certain kind of regulatory involvement, which has not been done so far, so that could also be another challenge. Then it also produces graphite as a waste, and this is something that we have to consider in terms of uh, sustainability as well, because, I mean, this radioactive graphite also has to be disposed. Now, there is different classification, class A, B, C, uh, depending upon how much toxicity is there in the material. But closer it is to the core, it becomes more difficult to, to dispose this as well. And then there is also, at least in, in US, I know there's this GTCC, which is greater than class C configuration. And I'm assuming a lot of graphite will fall under that category, which actually has to then eventually go to the geological disposal. So that means if there is a chance that a lot of waste coming from these kind of reactors might be required, there might be a requirement that this waste should go to uh, to deep geological disposal uh, if that happens. I mean, again, this is very preliminary analysis and discussion, so cannot be said with, with, with surety. There are many under, there, there is one under operation. I should have, I should have updated the slide. There is also another one under operation in China, which is the HTRPM. And I will take the example of HTRPM to, to do this exercise. So the HTRPM thermal power is around 458 megawatt thermal. This is a twin unit plant. The efficiency that we can reach is around 45%. Uh, the primary coolant use is helium. The outlet temperature is around 750 degrees Celsius. Uh, the pressure that we reach is, we need is seven megapascal. And part of the reason is because we have to pump uh, this uh, helium through the reactor. So it needs a high pumping power and that's why we have to pressurize the system. Uh, the moderator is graphite, the thermal spectrum, uh, the spectrum is thermal. And again, as I said, the question of sustainability comes into picture because there will be large amount of uh, activated uh, uh, graphite, which will be the, in the classification of the right waste that's gonna come out of it. Uh, for safety and reliability, we can assume that this, these are gonna be safer because it has been touted as a walk away safe reactor. And in terms of economics, uh, there might be certain improvement. While this could be still challenging to say because uh, the trice of fuel particle might be expensive now in the initial stages, but again, depends upon if it's uh, developed uh, more and it has mass production, it can become cheaper as well. So this is an example of uh, how the pebble bed reactor will work. You can see the pebbles coming from the top in, in batches. And then, as I said, one batch takes at least one year to, to pass through it. Uh, almost 500,000 pebbles are there in the core. And, but we can recycle them multiple times 
from six to 10 times, it can go into the core. And the average burn up that we can reach is around uh, 90 megawatt days per, per gram of uranium. I mean, uh, briefly about the pebble fuel, those who missed my first lecture is that it's in the shape of a spherical ball around 60 uh, millimeter in, in diameter, which has a, got a lot of trisoparticle, around 15,000 trisoparticle into each of the pebble. Here it says around uh, 11,000, so it, it, the range depends. And the trisoparticle itself is, has a kernel of uranium dioxide or uranium carbide, depending upon the, uh, the, the reactor design, and followed by some carbon as well as a pyrolytic layer. So this is to keep the integrity of the fuel, as well as to provide some kind of uh, moderation capability in the reactor itself. <clears throat> so this is more information about the HTRPM design itself. As I said, it's a twin reactor, producing around 210 megawatt of electricity. The power density is low, around uh, two to three megawatt per meter cube. And just to compare, just to compare it with the pressurized water reactor, it's a factor of 30 less than a pressurized water reactor. And I think compared to a sodium cooled fast reactor, it's going to be a factor of at least two order of magnitude could go could go low as well. Then for it has got high thermal inertia, so that's good. That comes with the graphite itself. Uh, there is no need for, I mean, this is debatable, but let's say for the core emergency cooling system. Uh, because the decay heat is removed by the natural mechanism. And I'll show you in the next slide how this is done. So here you can see again some parameters from the SGRPM itself. Uh, as you can see, the control is done through the control rods in the reflector region. The, the vessel itself is quite narrow, it's three meter, but quite tall. And the reason for that is first, because the control rods are in the periphery. So we need to have enough worth in case if, they are need, if the reactor needs to shut down. Plus in case of decay heat removal, which has to be passive, the decay heat could be done through conduction and convection mechanism uh, through the large surface area of the reactor. So they can uh, move towards the outside and this tall core can just remove the heat through the natural convection process as well. Uh, the gas cycle is that it comes from the inlet, goes on the top, flows through all the, so it's not going against the gravity, it's going with the gravity as well as with the flow of the pebbles and then comes out of the reactor as, as, as hot gas. We can use direct Brayton cycle also in this, but that's an area of development that's happening. And this can also improve the efficiency of the reactor further and also help in reducing the cost of the reactor. Okay. Uh, we saw that the weakness of, again, I'm talking just to continue the story is that the weakness of supercritical water reactor as well as the high temperature reactor is low breeding gain. So what can we do in order to improve the goal one? So, so far we have been tackling other goals uh, but we have not been able to improve the question of, uh, let's say, the breeding in. How we can uh, do that? Any ideas on that? Five seconds again. What kind of reactor design will be useful in order to do that? Fast spectrum. Very good. Perfect. We have an answer. So good. People are finally awake. So yeah, we can change the design to obtain the, the fast neutron spectrum. That's how we can do. And that's the next reactor in my cycle that comes is the gas cooled fast reactor concept. So we are still in the gas cooled reactor. So we are using high temperature gas cooled reactor, but now we want to have some breeding gain. So why not just uh, keep the good properties that we were able to reach with the gas cooled designs, but make it a fast reactor concept. So in this, we don't need any moderator. We can still use helium, which is non-toxic uh, uh, as the coolant. And we can also use it in both direct and indirect cycles could be considered uh, uh, for this. Uh, in this case, we have considered an indirect cycle. So the advantages are the potential for new fissile breeding due to fast neutron spectrum, and we'll see more into the coming designs that will come. Uh, the coolant is transparent and inert. That's what we were trying to reach when we were moving from supercritical water reactor. Um, the challenges are the safety demonstration, in particular, the decay removal in case of loss of flow and the depressurization accidents. Uh, there are certain engineering solutions for that, which are in the which I will also cover in, in, in one of the slides. And then again, because we are working at high temperature, so there will be challenges for high temperature material as well as the fuel qualification that will be required for, for this reactor design. There are uh, several, some under development, let's say the Allegro design, as well as the gas cool fast reactor design from the European Union. Uh, plus there are some private companies also like uh, energy multiplier module from, from General Atomics, which are also under development. Uh, under operations are probably none so far. 
these are the characteristics of uh, gas cooled fast reactor specific design chosen is gas cooled fast reactor from the european union uh, the thermal power is 2000 mega 2400 megawatt efficiency is 45% coolant is helium the pressure is we need as i said we need for the pumping we need some high pressure but we also have to take into consideration what happens in the depressurization accident when there is no helium flow in the in the reactor how will we remove the heat in case we are not able to flow the uh, coolant through the reactor uh, the moderator there is no moderator so we are dealing with the problem of uh, low thermal inertia in that case we had the graphite which was able to capture some of the heat but not in this case breeding gain we are improving so that means we are improving the sustainability in terms of safety and reliability it could be more or less we don't know but because of this uh, issue of depressurization and having low thermal inertia it still need to be question and economics we cannot say with uh, any kind of uh, surety because we have not seen any uh, major development happening in this area the fuel will be quite uh, similar as we have seen before so i will not go through it uh, this is how the gas cooled uh, the gas cooled fast reactor core will look like it will also be a very tall core uh, with some inner core fuel assemblies as well as outer core fuel assemblies uh, then there will be fission gas plenums for uh, release of the fission gases uh, through the through the core then there will be some reflectors uh, as well as the other uh, shutdown rods as well as the safety safety devices that are required uh, here you can see that uh, there are certain active decay heat removal pump in this design and there is a main power conversion loop which will convert the uh, heat uh, to electricity plus the control rod shut down drive mechanism is, is also from the bottom there is also a concept to have a spherical guard vessel all across the uh, reactor to maintain the pressure boundary or uh, have one more defense in depth layer so for the balance of plant it's also very conceptual as you can see here is the uh, guard vessel but most of the things uh, are quite similar so there is a decay heat removal pool with uh, an active four circulation so this has so this needs to be qualified that in case of or an accident or requirement this should work and then the uh, second side is similar to any any kind of uh, power conversion system so i will not spend much time so there are ways to improve the safety so instead of uh, coolant thermal inertia some kind of mechanical thermal inertia could be used by the help of some blowers or things like that uh, the passive decay heat removal loop could also use uh, brayton cycle and then make it Uh, passive instead of active so there are certain ways as i said engineering solutions which can also make it uh, improve the the safety okay so what can we do next i mean we have done this so the weakness of the gas cooled fast reactor is low thermal inertia as we saw and that means we require some special safety measures in case of uh, in, in in order to avoid the core meltdown or 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 things like that or in case of depressurization events how to remove the heat so what can we do to improve the goal too which is the safety so what can we have something which can have better thermal inertia or better ways to remove heat from the core any quick guess 5 seconds the, uh, the answer is using, to use molten uh, salt okay someone was saying online also something please go ahead uh, yes i was uh, going to say that uh, using a moderator or a coolant that is operating at the lower pressure normally is better like uh, sodium okay so okay. is a so, molten salt or sodium two answers let's see so the story goes in the way that we are looking at how we can extract more heat so we need something which can conduct better heat as well as a better thermal inertia so instead of gas let's start to use liquid metal that could also be a good option so why not use that and the first concept that we can use is uh, this sodium cooled fast reactor concept which i'm sure you have heard a lot already from from vladimir and i think there was also a lecture before me on on sodium uh, on on liquid metal coolant by christian lagge so probably you already know more than i know about the liquid metal coolant so so that's good so this is brief schematic of a pool type design but you saw in vladimir's lecture that it could also be a, a loop type design depending upon in some cases seismic requirements but there could be other requirements as well but this is loop type design where you see the primary sodium is here there is an intermediate heat exchanger and then there is a steam generator so why do we need an intermediate heat, heat exchanger is also quite evident that uh, there is a, a big reaction that uh, sodium can have when it comes in contact with air or 
or water so we want to avoid that and that's why we want to have an intermediate loop which will avo avoid these kind of uh, accidents so the advantage is that there is a potential for new fissile breeding due to fast neutron spectrum uh, there is an excellent uh, thermal conductivity of sodium which can offer very efficient cooling that's what we were looking for there is large margin to boiling so it's not going to boil very far very, very easily and there is no pressurization required so it will be operating at uh, atmospheric pressure or, or slightly above that. And there is significant operation experience, almost more than 400 reactor years of operation. Uh, the challenges, as I already identified in, uh, in the previous slide, was the chemical ac chemically active and in contact with water and air. So that means uh, we need an intermediate circuit. That means we have an engineering solution. That's what I always emphasize. So there Can is. I, a possible... Sorry, we are still on the slide with uh, gas graphite, gas cooled reactor. Is it? I have. How about oh. the online participants? Which slide do you no, see? At least it's okay. No, here it's okay. It's on mine. On my screen, some something is wrong. Okay, okay. sorry. No worries. <laughs> go over it. Okay, I go ahead. So uh, there could be a chance of positive reactivity effect, and then we need to have some special safety measures for that and. Most of the designs know how to do that. Uh, there are several designs under development. I forgot to cross asteroid from it. It's no longer under development now. And then they're under operation like BN600, BN800, and China Experimental Fast Reactor in China. And there are several under construction as well. So some properties of the ESFR, which is the European Sodium Cooled Fast Reactor concept. It has got thermal power of 3,600 megawatt, efficiency of 42%. Uh, the primary coolant is, is sodium, marked in red. Some, all the fields which need considerations are actually marked in red. Uh, the pressure is, as you can see, is, is almost atmospheric pressure. The outlet temperature is, is pretty high, around 545 degrees Celsius. Spectrum is, is fast. Uh, the goals of sustainability, safety and reliability are more or less because we're able to remove more heat, but then we bring this problem of uh, uh, sodium activity with water or air. And then economics is something uh, which will always be questionable till we deploy them. Uh, this is brief description of the SFR fuel rod and the, and the fuel subassembly. Uh, the fuel the fuel is it could be mixed uranium or plutonium oxide. I think that's what has happened also in, in BN 600 and 800. They're using MOX fuel and it's uh, stainless steel. Uh, they're hexagonal fuel assemblies and uh, they have no possible cross flow within this wrapper. So there is like there could be inter wrapper flow between these hexagonal ducts. But as I told you in the light water reactor, there is also cross flow between the assemblies, but it's not happening in the, in the fast reactor. And the absorbers are also in, inserted in the dedicated assembly. So like in the uh, light water reactor, the control rods are actually in every assembly, not, not in the case of uh, sodium cooled fast reactor. Part of the reason is it's a compact core and uh, it needs to be also, the reactivity also needs to be managed accordingly for that. Uh, there is large, uh, uh, gas planum both above and, and below the below the rod as well uh, this is the radial core layout of the esfr smart design uh, it's uh, almost perfectly symmetric has uh, the configuration usually in most of the fast sector of the inner outer core reflectors as well as shielding uh, it has got two groups of absorber rods for the reactor shutdown one is called as control and shutdown devices or rods and then there is like diversified shutdown devices and these diversified shutdown devices are there, they are activated with the Curie point electromagnetic locks. And I think there was some explanation done on this in, in one of the lectures before. But if not, it's like at certain temperature, these electromagnetic locks will open and the, uh, and the rods will automatically fall down. So this is a passive shutdown mechanism which can be inserted in this, in this concept. This is just the actual layout of the, of the reactor. So you can see that uh, there is a fissile fuel. It's uh, has a bit of higher enrichment of the plutonium, so that's what we need first to start the reactor, and then later it can breed the fuel and then uh, fill it itself. And that's what the challenge that a lot of uh, fast reactor vendors are facing is to how to get this high SA low enriched uranium to start the reactor or, or to get some some plutonium to start the reactor. Uh, this is uh, the. <clears throat> global view of the ESFR design from the top, which has got a three primary loop, but has got six steam generator. It's a, it's a big reactor. 
and they also got some passive decay heat removal system is through air uh, sodium to air conversion uh, this is uh, probably i think uh, for the asfr design uh, chris chan will also have a, a lot of more understanding than i have for that uh, this is the as i said it's a pool type design so this gives a, a, a axial cutway of of the reactor and then you can see that uh, the control rod drive mechanism is from the top the core is here and there is upper and lower plenum to to feed the Uh, sodium through the core the balance of plant concept is also similar so this as i said this is a decay heat removal system which is sodium to air six heat exchangers used uh, and the rest of the few heat transfer is done through an intermediate heat exchanger and then finally to the through the steam generator and the fuel used is uranium plutonium dioxide fuel so the balance of plant is, is not similar not not very different okay now moving to the fifth concept uh the sfr is the most mature concept among all the gif designs uh however we saw that there is one small weakness which is the sodium water or sodium air reaction uh so how we can uh, improve uh, the goal 2 and 3 in this case while keeping the goal 1 so we still want to breed we still want to keep it sustainable but how how we can improve goal 2 and 3 okay 5 seconds to answer what we can do let majority select lead very good i think not many options are left uh, to to discuss so yeah so the right answer is we have to use some another liquid instead of sodium so uh, what can we use instead of sodium the one of the obvious answer comes is some other liquid metal and that uh, liquid metal turns out to be the lead cooled fast reactor and i think uh, uh, vladimir artishuk was praising lead quite a lot yesterday and i will join that praise for the lead that lead is a double ma double magic uh, nucleide and you can use it in any configuration as you want uh, depending upon the requirements so yeah lead is also one of uh, my personal favorite design uh, but it's it's simple there is no need for the intermediate uh, circuit and the uh, and, and and several other things uh, which are which are listed here in terms of advantages so that means there is still potential for new fissile breeding due to fast neutron spectrum there is high density so that means the thermal inertia is actually very high i mean sodium is not that dense i mean the density is comparable to the water but for lead the density is is really really high <clears throat> there is high thermal conductivity and expansion coefficient so that means we can efficiently remove the heat at the low velocities and i think that's what you have done in the exercise also uh, to compare that how much velocity is actually required and probably it will be good to see uh, what what comes out to that Uh, and there is a possibility for this high natural circulation level that could be achieved uh, with this kind of configuration this is passive with water or air so no intermediate circuit required and there is actually very very large boil margin to boiling so probably you will never reach boiling in, in this case so anything that has to be do like two phase lead is not going to happen so that's uh, a very good news for any of the people who are working in thermal hydraulics then the challenges are again high density becomes a challenge because when you scrub the high density material through the Uh, through the through the system it causes erosion and uh, some seismic refueling issues uh, at high temperature the structure materials such as iron or nickel are also slowly dissolving in lead uh, so that means some kind of uh, coating is needed and we did a very interesting technical meeting vladimir did and i was supporting him on the structural material requirements and there were a lot of papers presented actually on lead cooled fast reactors that how these kind of structure how the structural material could be saved with different kind of coating so there are many engineering solutions that are coming up uh, to protect the material uh, there is low margin to freezing so that's very important so that means we have to keep it hot most of the time so that that's a challenge to do there are several designs under development and there are many commercial companies also uh, developing this concept so there are no operators reactors under operation is it as we know we have some experience from the submarine but not from any of the commercial operation so some characteristics of the alfred project that has been taken for this uh, story the thermal power is 300 megawatt the efficiency is high we use sodium as a or we use lead as a as a coolant the outlet temperature is around 480 degrees celsius the pressure is still atmospheric pressure let's assume uh, there is no moderator spectrum is fast we have limited operational experience and economics we all know till we do it this is the assembly of uh, of lead uh, and you can see probably that 
it has been divided into two regions because the the reactor is really really tall and this helps uh, this kind of configuration helps uh, in in maintaining the integrity of the of the structure as well uh this is the brief schematic of the uh, core of the of the alfred reactor that same as any of the fast reactor inner core outer core and then control rods the reflectors and the shielding <clears throat> this is the actual cutaway of of alfred reactor showing the primary system it's also a pool type reactor uh, which has got enhanced natural convection in case of accidents the decay removal is done through isolation condensers which are connected to the deep coolers with straight double wall tubes uh, and uh, the reactivity control is also done as we see with the two diverse and redundant systems which is the control and shutdown system as we saw in the ESFR small ESFR project as well uh, <clears throat> this is the balance of plant again because the concept is not that developed beyond so that's why you always see the schematics of balance of plant but will not be very different so you will see some uh, primary side flow like this and then for secondary side uh, the water will be used uh, reaching uh, higher temperatures and then using the high pressure low pressure turbine and the condenser and the feed water to feed it back uh, to the reactor core okay cool so we have come to the five designs now we have, we'll, we'll slowly move to the six design so what we have seen that in all of the systems uh, the accident with the core meltdown has extremely low probability already uh, but they might still be possible. Huh? So in case uh, it can still happen. So how we can practically eliminate uh, the core meltdown? Any quick guess? Using liquid fuel uh, like uh, molten salt. Perfect. Uh, so if if the core is already molten, then there is no probability of have a core meltdown because this is already molten. So uh, that's where we come to the design that we can use the design with a liquid fuel. So molten salt reactor can be used in, in a thermal configuration, as you can see here, where we use uh, some kind of moderator. Uh, or what I've done here is just put a block here to just show that in case there is nothing, then it can be used also as a, as a fast uh, spectrum reactor. And then uh, the primary fuel or the liquid fuel could be kept separate from the secondary through a heat exchanger. And then we can have a tertiary heat exchanger for the uh, steam supply for the for the power island there are several advantages so again it has potential for fissile breeding due to fast neutron spectrum there is large margin to boiling so that means again this can operate at atmospheric pressure uh, there is strong negative fuel salt density and i think you will have a lecture on uh, uh, molten salt reactors separately but you can guess also intuitively that in case let's say there is a void that happens in the in the core that means you are also displacing the fuel. So if you are displacing the fuel, that means you are also reducing the reactivity. So this will have a negative reactivity feedback. There is high efficiency due to high temperature. Uh, there are no or almost minimum structural materials. So I'm not talking about the vessel itself, but the structural material are almost no or minimum. So that means we are not doing any radiation damage to the structural material. The possibility to add or remove salt is, is very easy. You can have a certain loop which can just uh, filter process the fuel and, and send it back to the to the to the reactor and we can also because of this possibility we can also remove uh, continuously the insoluble fusion products but the challenges are molten salt fuel will be highly corrosive so that means it can affect at least the pressure vessel or, or the vessel itself it's not a pressurized vessel so the lack of usual ba barriers which is like we have for for the for the for the conventional reactors like fuel colliding or the other reactors is not there uh, but there might be other ways to prove that these kind of uh, barriers are actually not required for molten salt reactors. Uh, the part of the fuel is always uh, outside the core, so that means um, we need a larger fuel inventory is needed. There is low margin to freezing. Uh, and then, of course, there's lower unknown solubility of compounds formed during the operation because there has not been a lot of operational experience. So we still have to see what compounds can actually form when there is ingress of uh, some other structural material that goes into the molten salt react molten salt there are several under development but none under operation so the example here is of the msfr from the european union again this is a open core it's a fa it's a, it's it's a, it's a fast reactor concept and it has got again three circuits which is like uh, the fuel circuit the intermediate circuit and then for the energy conversion system a tertiary circuit uh, most of the designs also have this draining tank in case of 
any kind of accident, uh, the drain plug can open and all the salt can go into the drain tank and then freeze there safely and be subcritical as well. This is again simple schematic for the heat exchanger, which goes from the secondary to the tertiary side. Uh, we can reach higher temperature in, in molten salt reactor practically around 800 to 900 degrees Celsius. And then we can have this uh, intermediate uh, cooling loop to, to remove the heat and send it to the heat conversion. Now the MSRs have, to be honest, like massive amount of configuration that you can play around. And this is the GIF classification that came out in 2020. Uh, they can have graphite moderated and fluoride salt. So, I mean, I have not differentiated here and I should between, and you will see in one of the slides that the molten salt these days, as they're considered, it could be like molten coolant or molten fuel. But our focus is on the molten fuel, not necessarily on the molten solid, but this classification consider, considers everything. So they could be graphite moderated, they could be homogeneous fast reactor, or they could be some other concept. So you can see from here some examples as well as how they will actually come out to be. So for example, if they have a solid fuel, uh, which will be trisoparticle in the graphite, it will be pebble bed or prismatic as is the case to high temperature gas cool reactor. However, the coolant that goes through it is, is molten salt. And that's why they are molten salt reactors as well, but they're actually, uh, yeah, FHRs as they're as they called more conventionally. So this is the new classification that agency has done, the IA has done in 2022. Uh, this document is not yet published. It's in the preprint and should be out, I think hopefully next year. Maybe Vladimir will know more about this, but they have also done the classification based on the GIF. And that's how the classification has come out. It's probably difficult to read here. So I've put a table which shows clearly that the fluoride salt cooled reactors, this family is different, which has the solid fuel from the graphite moderated, which has the liquid fuel. And then you can see which spectrum they work in. You can see the type of salts they are working in. It could be fluoride or, or, or chloride salts, depending upon again on the spectrum as well you will see that most of the fast spectrums are using chloride, but some of the fast spectrum in the homogeneous structure could also use fluorides. Uh, what configuration they can work, like burner, breeder, converter, there could also be possibility of to burn the minor actinides, which as you can see here, uh, and several other criteria like uh, what kind of heat transfer uh, mechanism is, is, is needed, is used here, and where the primary heat exchangers are also located. So in summary, coming to the end of the story, and I hope uh, you enjoyed this journey from one design to another, targeting one goal to another. We have seen like six GIF designs, and we have seen some advantages as well as the challenges of these designs. Uh, but these are not to rank. I mean, that does not mean that the one that was shown first, like the supercritical water reactor is worse than molten salt reactor. This was just to weave the story, to go from one design to another, and how to maybe to critically think that how we can improve one parameter to reach to another kind of design. But this is in no way to rank the designs that uh, which one is better than the other. But some of the issues are highlighted in the red, which I call them as engineering challenges. Some of them have found the engineering solutions. Some, some of them have not found them. Uh, some of them have not been found. Uh, but hopefully once they become more real, uh, we'll be able to see how these are actually resolved. And then something to, for you to think about uh, that uh, this graph shows that what ranges actually all of these plants can actually can work on. So at, at different uh, pressure ranges as well, uh, but probably I will not go into this. This is for you to, to think about that in terms of uh, operational ranges and the coolant densities, uh, how they could be, could be useful or not, I mean, if you see that uh, the density suddenly changes after a certain temperature or pressure, what it can actually do to the operation and whether it's feasible to operate in that range or whether it's advisable to operate in that range or not. So this is something for you to, to consider later. Okay, these are the references. And I think I was able to complete it in time for some questions and answers as well. Thank you very much. Perfect. Okay, thank you very much, Rayu. And before we start questions, I'd like to notice that you forgot, when you started the history of Generation 1 reactor, you forgotten to notice the first nuclear power plant, which was start operation in 1954 in Obninsk. We have people from Obninsk, they just reminded me this. 
Sure, I will put that in the slide. I'll update okay. the slide. <laughs> Any questions from here? Okay, what is the mic? Yes, thank you. Uh, Shirayu is Christian here. Just a question Thanks. about, I have some maybe comments and maybe a question. I think you have not addressed two, two uh, points. I don't know where they are, maybe in the safety, but what about the, uh, the, the, the civil accidents, for example, uh, for lead, for example? Uh, I have never seen a real uh, detailed analysis of the civil accidents in lead fast reactors. People claim that the corium go on the surface, but after that, uh, in sodium or in the light elements, the corium go in the, uh, thanks to gravity, go in the direction of uh, uh, core catcher, okay? Mm -hmm. So, and uh, with the possibility to distribute the corium, but what about the, the lead? Uh, in uh, molten salt reactors, we say, okay, there is a safe concept with regard to this point, but what about the risk of modification of the chemistry with the possibility to have some uh, 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 meltdown. Uh, yeah, it's melt, yes, but uh, what about the possibility to have some modification of the stability of, the, of some compounds in, due to the, the, due to the uh, creation of new products? And yeah. uh, what about the, the, the decommissioning also? Uh, <laughs> I think that the commissioning, when you, now when you decide to build the reactor, you need also to provide a, a strategy for the decommissioning. So what about, the, for example, the lead fast reactors about the decommissioning? People claim we can freeze, just only freeze, and okay, and after. Uh, so, and a point also, a last point, a last comment. About we say that on the lead fast reactor, we avoid the intermediate circuit. This is true, but not totally true, because if you look, for example, in a, they decided in a lead fast reactor to have a double wall, because when you have interaction between liquid metal and uh, and uh, and the um, and the water, okay, you have mm -hmm. uh, you have a possibility to have uh, you have two you have a physical interaction and chemical. So chemical for sodium, we have a production of hydrogen mostly, not really pressure waves, but okay. But uh, this is one point that is to be underlined. And, uh, and uh, I think, and uh, yes, we have made recently an exercise. Of course, we have less investment about the, the we have intermediate circuits, but what about the handling operations in uh, in heavy liquid metals, so it's not so easy due to the buoyancy and so on. So we don't, I don't, I don't know if you have really a, a good appreciation of the extra cost on the handling systems in uh, lead fast reactor. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay Christian. you know Thank that you. Christian is against, so only sodium is good, yeah, so please, <laughs> please explain. Yeah, no, I think uh, I, I acknowledge your comments, most of them, so, uh, probably many of them can actually go into challenges, to be honest. But I can briefly talk on a few of them. So one is on the molten salt reactor. <clears throat> so think about how the salt configuration might change depending upon the, let's say, the operation and the ingress of other uh, com com compound formation that can happen while it's, in, while it's in the operation. So that challenge, I think, is known, but the possible solution for that that is being considered is to reduce the lifetime of the reactor vessel. So if you can reduce that lifetime to a point where not major modifications have happened into the molten salt itself, then probably you are still in the zone of unknown, but you, you can still operate safely. Now, how this will impact the economics is a different discussion. So maybe it will affect a lot, maybe it will not affect a lot. So this is uh, something that is uh, being considered in the industry and then it's known. Now for, for lead, 
I mean, I, I'm sure you know more about Kuyens than I do. That, that's, that's a fact. Uh, I think at least from the perspective of uh, decommissioning, let's say, uh, lead could, and this could be debatable, lead could provide better possibilities than sodium cool fast reactor. So this is probably, I will, I will say with the sense of, 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 of a bit of a doubt as well. Uh, but other than that, talking about how the economics might improve because there might be more requirement for handling, yeah, this is something I'm not sure I can say with any kind of certainty because till it happens or till at least some designs are at higher level of development, we will never know. I mean, most of the designs are still at the stage of core designing. I mean, the plant designing, as I, I was not able to find any of the reference where actually the plant designing has happened. So probably till that stage happens, we'll be in a very difficult situation to answer that question. And rest of the comments are acknowledged very nicely, I think. Thank you for adding that. Okay, th thank you. Just to add about the lead also, I'm not also, I'm not against lead or not pro lead. I'm pro everything, whatever, whatever the nuclear technologies are to develop, yeah, okay. But what the designers of the lead reactor, we say reactor of natural safety. Uh, they say since lead never boils, which is probably not very true, so, but theoretically reaching the temperature of the fuel could be, okay, but let's say we assume that lead doesn't boil. If it doesn't boil, there is no reason for this criticality accident on, and there is no reason for the core meltdown. Of course, if, if you melt the core, and in this case, if, for example, contour roads, if the structure still is molten and destroyed, contour roads will do what? They will float up or something. So before you see, boron carbide will be out of the core, it probably has criticality. But the main reason they say simply there is no negative, vo positive, sorry, void, void reactivity effect in that reactor, and there is no reason. Could you imagine any ULOF, for example, calculations of the ULOF show that with natural circulation would be enough to remove decay, uh, the heat, okay? Decay heat, on, and heat, and also reactor will be shut down automatically without counter rows. But depends on the position, of course. What kind of uh, compaction due to the gravity, I mean, under seismic conditions could be lead to the, the criticality or uh, what else, or unpro uh, un unprotected trip of, trip of power, like sudden insertion of the counter roads could be also the reason, but basically there is no physical reason why it should cause it should melt and to Of course, we don't have, the problem is that we don't have experience with sodium. We have long experience with lead. We had with lead vismuth also partly successful, I would say, and we had accidents with lead vismuth reactors. Uh, okay, we don't know exactly the reasons, but can imagine that that was happened. So the main problem is that there were no experience, but then now we are gaining the experience. There are many, especially here in Italy, there are many researchers who are doing with lead, jointly with Romania, doing this. Alfred already site is selected in Romania. Unfortunately, in Italy, the nuclear power is prohibited by referendum, but the researchers are working here. Okay. Any other questions to Chirayu? Uh, thank you for enlightening lecture. So I wanted to know about the depressurization accident and any strategy to prevent that. In which reactor specifically? Um, in general, <laughs> it was the main problem okay. for super so critical super water super critical. Right or gas cool, like for gas, or gas, cool, gas cool reactor. Yeah. I can give a general answer as well. So <clears throat> what happens is like, so the why it, why it happens is like. You have to remove the heat in this, and 
the helium is is a light element and you need a high pumping power to go through it the what happens is like if we lose the pressure we lose also the capability to pump a lot of helium through it so that means we need to have a way how we can remove the heat in a passive way through that now what we saw in the high temperature gas cool reactors which have this narrow core uh, is like to remove it through conduction and convection so in case this happens there is nothing or the helium circuit is also broken there is loss of flow accident you can do do it through conduction and convection that's one way to do it now for gas cool fast reactors the possibility will be to do it uh, through a decay heat removal mechanism which could be active or passive so we need to have a certain mechanism which needs to work in order to remove this heat now if it's active we need to have redundancy or things like that when we have also in case of for example pressurized water reactor we have this emergency core cooling systems which have several tanks and several level of redundancy so this can be done in that case as well thank you if you talk about super critical water reactor i mean it's uh, it's water cooled so we can still probably maintain some level of natural circulation or uh, heat removal through this tall core if required okay any other questions or comments maybe from from online audience Should I do you see the questions in the chat I saw but okay no, thank you for the ESFR parameters so many yeah. people I know Dauda is interested in ESFR design which you presented probably right yeah. I can refer you to some papers which are published I mean and then professor Mickey Tuk is probably the best known source for ESFR <laughs> I will refer you to that I mean I'll probably I mean, even if you Google like ESFR, you will find a lot of papers. There are several designs. Uh, it's hypot okay, hypothetical reactor. <laughs> conceptual. <laughs> conceptual, <laughs> yeah, but it's conceptual. But there are several designs, and there are several projects of what we do. So, Chirai will send. Okay. Yeah. Okay. If yeah. not more, no more questions. Then again, Shri Batra, thank you very much for your lecture. And now we have a coffee break, and then we discuss group activities. This, is, this will be session just to discuss group activities, to see, to answer your questions. And then, should I, you, you, you attending? I will be here. If you are here, then probably I would like to skip. I skip my lunch, so I'll go and have a lunch. Are you try your flight? You want to skip your flight, or what? I want to check now. OK, OK. So in any case, on the way, welcome to attend. Sure. Okay, coffee break now.